So welcome back to today's lecture, guys. I'm actually trying out the headset today to see whether I can improve the sound quality for you all because I know some people were saying that there's like crinkling going on. So I'm curious to see whether that this fixes that. So today we're going over cardiac physiology with a focus on the conduction pathways and the cardiac action potentials. As always, I would print out your lecture handout, have it out and available to you so you can kind of follow along as we go through, and um, a set of learning objectives so you can pick out what the major points of today's lecture are. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start by doing a little bit of review on what the heart is and what the heart does. So the job of the cardiovascular system is to transport material around the body. And the conduit through which it does that is blood. So we've talked about blood in, uh, extensively at this point. Now, the heart is a hydraulic pump, and it rhythmically contracts and relaxes to generate a pressure gradient that pumps or moves that blood through the body in a system of tubes we call blood vessels. So starting at the left side of the heart, we know it's the left because the apex is here and we can see that the muscular wall in the left ventricle is much thicker than the right ventricle. So we know it has to be the left side of the heart. Blood in the left ventricle, when the ventricle enters into systole, is moved up and out the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. The aorta is a big artery and the aorta will eventually branch and feed into all of the arteries in the body. So those arteries, we call them systemic arteries because they're delivering blood to the entire system, right? Those systemic arteries are gonna carry oxygen nutrient rich blood to the different tissues of your body, like the muscles, the digestive tract, the brain. And that oxygen rich blood is gonna get to these tissues and from the arteries, it's gonna go into arterioles and then into capillaries. Capillaries are the most abundant and most important type of blood vessel because that's the point at which exchange occurs. So at these tissues, we're going to deliver oxygen and nutrients, and we're going to pick up carbon dioxide and metabolic waste. The blood that drains from these tissues is therefore going to be oxygen poor, and that's what we indicate with the blue blood vessels, is that it's oxygen poor, and it's going to be carbon dioxide rich. Whenever blood is O2 poor, it's always going to be CO2 rich. So that oxygen poor, carbon dioxide rich blood is then drained via the venules into a system of veins. Now, those veins will all converge at these two major veins here, the superior and inferior vena cava, before going into the right atrium, right? So the left side of the heart is responsible for pumping systemic circulation. The right side of the heart is responsible for pumping what's called pulmonary circulation. So blood will passively fill into the right ventricle. And remember, the atria don't fill the ventricles. They just top them off at the end. Atria contracts, right, forces blood down into the ventricles to top them off. Then the ventricles go into systole. When the right ventricle goes into systole, the tricuspid valve will snap shut. Blood will move up and out the pulmonary semilunar valve to the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries. At the pulmonary arteries, right, and remember the pulmonary arteries are indicated with blue. Blue doesn't necessarily mean artery or vein. It just indicates oxygenation status. Arteries carry blood away from the heart while veins bring blood back too. So because the pulmonary artery is moving blood away from the heart, it's moving O2 rich blood, and that's why it's indicated by blue, but it's moving that blood away from the heart to the lungs. Notice that the ventricular wall, the muscular wall of the right ventricle is much um, thinner than that of the left ventricle because it doesn't have to generate as much force just to get blood to the lungs and back. So the right side of the heart pumps what's called the pulmonary circuit. <clears throat> when blood gets to the lungs, right, to the capillary networks of the lungs. We get rid of carbon dioxide, we pick up oxygen, and that oxygen-rich blood is then returned back to the left side of the heart via the pulmonary veins. In the left side of the heart, right, pulmonary veins drain into the left atrium, left atrium through the bicuspid valve to the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, bicuspid valve snaps shut, aortic semilunar valve opens, badoom. So, then that blood moves into the systemic circulation. So we have an alternation between systemic circulation, which is intended to deliver oxygen nutrient rich blood to tissues. And then we have pulmonary circulation, which takes that carbon dioxide rich blood and it takes it to the lungs where we can get rid of that carbon dioxide and pick up more oxygen. 
Sorry, y'all. I had to switch back to using the built-in microphone, and I'm sorry if it crackles, but um, there was just nothing else I could do. It kept disconnecting from the Bluetooth, and it was making this excruciating. <clears throat> so when you think about the heart, the heart is a muscular pump that physically moves blood through the body. Rhythmically contracts and relaxes, or beats, anywhere from 150,000 to 400,000 times a day, billions of times throughout the course of your life. And if it stops, you stop. So it's a very important organ. So what is the heart physically comprised of or composed of? Well, there are two types of cells that make up the heart. The first type of cell you're probably most familiar with from the histology, and those are contractile cardiac muscle cells. Contractile cardiac muscle cells compose about 99% of the mass of the heart. Each muscle cell by mass is about 40% mitochondria, meaning that it, they require tons of ATP because mitochondria are responsible for producing ATP or energy. And when blood passes through the heart and the capillaries interact with these contractile cardiac muscle cells, those contractile cardiac muscle cells can extract about 65% of the O2 from blood. It's because they have this pigment called myoglobin, which binds to oxygen more tightly than hemoglobin, so it just strips that oxygen from the red blood cells. And that's because the cardiac, cardiac muscle cells use so much oxygen because they're making so much energy to fuel their activity, right? So really efficient compared to like other cells. Other cells extract 5 to 10% of the available O2 from blood, so that's pretty incredible that they're able to do that. And you'll notice that when the heart contracts, so we're looking over here at a turtle heart that's been taken out of its body. So that turtle is deceased, gone. And the heart, even after the turtle has been killed, continues to contract as long as there's ATP available for it to do so. So atria on top, ventricles, atria, ventricles, atria, ventricles. Notice how much bigger the ventricles are than the atria. Atria go into systole, then diastole. Ventricles go into systole, then diastole. So the mechanical events of the heart, the contraction of the atria and relaxation of the atria and the contraction of the ventricles and relaxation of the ventricles, that's coordinated, right? The atria and ventricles should never be contracting at the same time. It wouldn't be a very efficient mechanism of moving blood through the body, Right? Wouldn't be a very efficient mechanism of generating a unidirectional flow through the heart. There'd be big problems there. Now, how does the heart coordinate its mechanical rhythms? It does so through coordinating its electrical rhythms. The electrical rhythms of the heart dictate the mechanical rhythms. So the electrical events always come before the mechanical events. And the Cells in the heart that are responsible for regulating the electrical and subsequent mechanical rhythms of the heart are called the autorhythmic cells or pacemaker cells. They account for about 1% of the mass of the heart and what they do is they coordinate the electrical activity that spreads through the heart. So when we look at this image, this image or this GIF over here is intended to emphasize the autorhythmic cells and how the autorhythmic cells exert control over the contractile cells. What we're going to do is we're going to start in the upper right-hand corner of the right atrium. So in the upper right-hand corner of the right atrium, there is a bundle of autorhythmic tissue that is functionally and histologically unique from contractile cardiac muscle tissue. The job of autorhythmic cells is to rhythmically depolarize and repolarize, or rhythmically fire action potentials, right? And through the rhythmic firing of action potentials, the autorhythmic cells control the activity of the contractile cardiac muscle cells. So this is the SA node. The SA node, or sinoatrial node, rhythmically depolarizes and repolarizes faster than every other cell in the heart, at about 60 to 100 times per minute. Because the cells of the sinoatrial node rhythmically depolarize and repolarize faster than any of the other tissue in the heart, the cells of the sinoatrial node establish the pace of the heart, and therefore we refer to them as being pacemaker cells. So if you come back here and you look at the fact that the heart is contracting outside of the body, the heart doesn't need the nervous system or any of the other systems in order to contract. The ability to initiate contraction is inherent to the heart itself. The nervous system can just slow it down or speed it up a little bit.
So you have the cells of the SA node and they fire an action potential. As the action potential spreads through the heart, we call that the cardiac impulse. The cardiac impulse is the spread of the electrical activity through the heart or the sum of the action potential spreading through the heart. Now, the cells of the SA node, which are structurally and functionally unique from contractile cardiac muscle cells, are there to rhythmically fire electrical signals. They're not there to contract. This small bundle of cells then communicates with the contractile cardiac muscle tissue in the atria. Now, the autorhythmic cells of the SA node are connected to these contractile cells via what are called intercalated discs. And intercalated discs have a special type of junction in them called a gap junction. Gap junctions allow cells to communicate. So when these autorhythmic cells fire an electrical signal, that electrical signal spreads to the contractile cells. And because the contractile cells are branched and connected via other intercalated discs, once it spreads there, it can spread there, and it can kind of spread out to that wide array of contractile cells in the heart. That's how uh, such a small amount of tissue can regulate such a large process. So cells of the sinoatrial node fire an action potential, right? They depolarize. That depolarizing wave sweeps through the contractile cardiac muscle cells in the atria. If you remember back to skeletal muscle physiology from AMP1, in order for a skeletal muscle cell to contract, it must first fire an action potential. It's called excitation contraction coupling. So an electrical signal has to spread through a skeletal muscle fiber, and that electrical signal is what initiates the mechanical events of contraction. The exact same thing is true here with respect to cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle cells have to be excited. They have to fire an electrical signal before they can contract. So the electrical signal coordinates the contraction of those cells, and that's how autorhythmic cells exert control over the mechanical rhythms of the heart. So that depolarizing wave, right, that electrical signal spreads through the atria, and after that electrical signal spreads through the atria, or the atria depolarizes, the atria will subsequently contract or go into systole, excitation, contraction, coupling. So SA node fires the electrical signal, rhythmically fires it, establishes the cardiac impulse. Cardiac impulse or depolarizing wave, I'm just using multiple terms that mean the same thing, spread through the atria. Once the atria depolarize, they will subsequently go into systole and contract. Now, notice that one, the contraction of the atria doesn't fill the ventricles, it tops them off, contracts right at the end. Most of the time, the ventricles are just passively filling, right? Number two, notice that this next bundle that we call the atrioventricular node, that that electrical signal gets delayed. So that electrical signal gets delayed just a little bit. These cells don't conduct an electrical current quite as fast as other cells, so that electrical signal gets delayed a little bit. That's called AV node delay. So the AV node holds on to the cardiac impulse for about 0.1 seconds. And what that does is it gives the atria time to finish contracting or being in systole. So the atria depolarize, and then mechanically, so the electrical event is atrial depolarization, and then they contract, or they go into systole. When they contract, they move blood down into the ventricles, and they top the ventricles off. When the atria are contracting, notice that the tricuspid valve on the right side and the bicuspid valve on the left side are open. After the AV node delay, which gives the atria time to finish contracting, we spread into the bundle of Hiss, to the left and right bundle branches, and then up the left and right Purkinje fibers. Now, when that electrical signal spreads along the bundle of Hiss through the um, bundle branches and the interventricular septum up the Purkinje fibers, the ventricles first depolarize. That's the electrical event. The ventricles depolarize. An electrical signal has swept through all those cells. After the ventricles depolarize, they will subsequently contract or go into ventricular systole. So atrial systole, then diastole, ventricular systole, then diastole. So the ventricles depolarize, they excite, and then they contract. 
So the electrical event would be the depolarization of the ventricles. The mechanical event would be the, the ventricular systole or the ventricular contraction. The right ventricle moves blood up and out the pulmonary semilunar valve to the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary veins, where it's going to get rid of carbon dioxide at the pulmonary capillaries and pick up oxygen. The blood then returns from the lungs, the O2 rich blood, to the left atrium via the pulmonary veins, so pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, to the left atrium. Left atrium contracts, moves blood down through the bicuspid valve, aka the left atrioventricular valve, aka the mitral valve, to the left ventricle. Electrical signal spreads up the ventricles, right? Ventricle depolarizes, subsequently contract. Left ventricle moves blood up and out the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about in the next lecture in a tremendous amount of detail are heart sounds. Heart sounds are a consequence of valves opening and closing, specifically closing. So when the ventricle goes into systole, for example, notice that the tricuspid and bicuspid valve close. They snap shut, and there's a sound associated with that. It's your first heart sound. It's called your lub. Then when the ventricles go into diastole, the pulmonary semilunar and aortic semilunar valve snap shut. That's your second heart sound. It's called your dub. So we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on that in the next lecture. So now that we understand kind of the electrical conduction pathways of the heart just a little bit, let's throw in some terminology or introduce some terminology. Chronotropic, whenever I use the term chronotropic, which means time changes, what we're talking about is changes in heart rate. So anything that increases heart rate, right, like sympathetic nervous system innervation or stimulation, anything that increases heart rate, we say it has a positive chronotropic effect. As opposed to anything that decreases heart rate, we say it has a negative inotropic effect. And you're going to hear that or see that a lot on the exam. You're going to hear me use those terms quite frequently. Um, so just be familiar with them. The next term is inotropic. I-N means force and tropic means change. So when you talk about inotropic effects, you're talking about changes in contractile force. So when you say something, let's say a chemical compound like epinephrine has a positive inotropic effect, what that means is that it increases contractile force, right? as opposed to other medications or cardiac conditions that can produce a negative inotropic effect, and that decreases contractile force of the heart. And that's really important when we start getting into the mathematics of the heart, but I just want you to be familiar with that now because I'm going to be talking about positive and negative chronotropic effects in this lecture, and then in the next lecture we're really going to hit inotropic effects. So when you look at cardiac muscle tissue, contractile cardiac muscle tissue histology, Contractile cardiac muscle cells are structurally and histologically different than autorhythmic cells, right? The job of contractile cardiac muscle cells is to contract and generate force. And they're anatomically a bit distinct from like skeletal muscle in a few different ways. So if I ask you on, a, on an exam, identify the specific tissue indicated by the pointer and then list some important structural characteristics of this tissue, that's kind of what we're going over right now. So when you look at contractile cardiac muscle tissue, contractile cardiac muscle cells are kind of like these cylindrical tubes that branch. One of the first things I want you to understand is these cylindrical tubes branch. That means that one contractile cardiac muscle cell can communicate with two, those two can communicate with four, so on and so forth. That branching pattern is really important for two reasons. One, it allows the electrical signal to spread throughout all the tissue. Right? So a small amount of cells can activate or through the process of electrical amplification can activate a large amount of tissue. And two, that branching pattern changes the way that the contraction happens. So whereas skeletal muscle fibers twitch, cardiac muscle cells squeeze. And because of this branching pattern, it allows them to squeeze from multiple directions, which gives that heart, that the cardiac muscle, that different characteristic than skeletal muscle. Two, I want you to realize that cardiac muscle cells are connected via what are called intercalated discs. So one cell is connected to its neighbor along what's called an intercalated disc. Within each intercalated disc, you have what are called gap junctions. Gap junctions are proteins that essentially form molecular donuts. 
And what gap junctions do is they allow ions to flow from one cell to the next. So the stimulus for a contractile cardiac muscle cell firing an action potential is actually its neighbor firing an action potential, right? And ultimately, the cells that are closer to the autorhythmic cells are going to fire action potentials first, and then these ones next and next and next, but it happens very quickly. That electrical signal can spread very quickly among that tissue because those cells are connected via those intercalated discs that have those gap junctions. So the electrical signal just jumps from one cell to the next to the next. That action potential or depolarizing wave is allowed to jump from one cell to the next along these intercalated discs through the gap junctions. One of the things I want you to know about intercalated discs, another thing I want you to understand about intercalated discs is they also have what are called desmosome junctions. And desmosome junctions are just these really powerful junctions that physically hold cells together so they don't rip apart, right? You gotta think the heart is contracting and relaxing all day. All of the tension and force that's put on those cells, you'd think that they'd just kind of separate out and rip apart eventually. They don't because of those desmosomes. Now, when you look internally in ca contractile cardiac muscle tissue, you'll notice that it's striated, meaning it has this striped appearance. Those striations are a consequence of sarcomeres. So just like skeletal muscle cells have sarcomeres, cardiac muscle cells have sarcomeres, and the mechanism of contraction is almost identical. Myosin binds to actin, right? The thick th filament pulls the thin filament over it. The sarcomere gets shorter, contraction occurs. And that's from excitation-contraction coupling, which we're going to go over with respect to cardiac muscle tissue quite closely as well. So it's striated, and instead of being multinucleated, each cell tends to be uninucleated, meaning it has one nucleus. So if you're following along, that's slide five. We're just going slide one, slide two, slide three, slide four, slide five, if you want to take a moment to think about that. And when you look at contractile cardiac muscle tissue under the microscope, if I say, give me three anatomical characteristics that led you to your answer, well, the fact that they're uninucleated, the tissue itself, if you look over here, is highly branched when we have it at a higher magnification, and that changes the way cells communicate with one another and the way they tug on one another. It allows them to squeeze. And the fact that each of these cells, doesn't matter if you're looking over here or over here, right, they're connected via intercalated discs. And those intercalated discs allow one cell to communicate with its neighbor. So the stimulus for one cell to fire an action potential is its neighbor firing an action potential, which is ultimately triggered by the autorhythmic cells at the point of origin. Right? Also, you can see the striations, those stripe patterns, those are reflective of the sarcomeres, which ultimately generate that contractile force. So I would say branched, uninucleated, striated, definitely point out the intercalated discs and be able to tell me what the intercalated discs do. What are the proteins in there that give cardiac muscle tissue many of its properties? Because those intercalated discs are hugely important. Now, we've watched a turtle heart video, and we saw that the heart was contracting and relaxing independently from any kind of nervous system stimulation. The ability of the heart to rhythmically contract and relax is intrinsic to the heart. The heart can initiate its own electrical signals, right? It doesn't need information coming from the nervous system. And therefore, right, even if you were to take a heart out of one person and put it into another person, you're still going to have the heart being able to initiate contraction and relaxation. It does that through the autorhythmic cells. The autorhythmic cells tell the contractile cells what to do. And that's how we coordinate the rhythms of the heart. So the SA node is the pacemaker. It rhythmically fires action potentials at about 60 to 100 action potentials per minute when you're talking about conduction. That's what I'm talking about on your follow along. And because it fires action potentials, rhythmically fires action potentials faster than any of the other cells, or rhythmically depolarizes and repolarizes faster than the other cells, it establishes the pace at which all the other cardiac tissue ultimately depolarizes. So we call it the pacemaker of the heart. So when I say it's rhythmically firing action potentials at 60 to 100 action potentials per minute, I'm saying heart rate is going to be 60 to 100 beats per minute. Because if you have a healthy heart, when the SA node fires an action potential, that's going to spread through the entirety of the heart and lead to contraction of the atria and the ventricles, which is what we think of as a heartbeat. The AV node, right? So... SA node fires the action potential. 
the depolarizing wave or cardiac impulse sweeps through the atria. The atria depolarize and then they subsequently contract, right? So the electrical event is depolarization. The mechanical event is contraction. The AV node holds on to that electrical signal for just about 0.1 seconds to give the atria time to finish systole, finish contracting. Atria top the ventricles off. They don't fill them up. Then that electrical signal is allowed into the bundle of Hiss, the left and right bundle branches, and then up the Purkinje fibers. After that, the ventricles will subsequently depolarize. After they depolarize, they will contract. So the electrical event would be the depolarization of the ventr ventricles. The mechanical event would be the contraction of the ventricular systole. That's really important when you're trying to understand an EKG, that you have electrical events and then mechanical events. In order for contractile cardiac muscle cells to contract, or any muscle cell to contract, it must first fire an action potential. That's called excitation-contraction coupling. The electrical event always comes before the mechanical event with muscle. So the AV node, let's say that the SA node was just to give out. The AV node can actually establish a cardiac rhythm, but it fires action potentials much more slowly right? In fact, it fires them at an inadequate rate to keep the blood moving effectively through the body. So if there's something interfering with the communication between these two guys, that can be massively problematic. The Purkinje fibers can also fire action potentials, but they fire them really, really slow. So because the SA node in a healthy heart is firing those action potentials faster than any of the other tissues, right? That's what should be establishing the rhythm of the heart. One of the things that we're going to talk about when we get into the EKG is what are called ectopic pacemakers. An ectopic pacemaker is just a chunk of tissue that's establishing the cardiac rhythm other than the sinoatrial node. And only the sinoatrial node should be establishing cardiac rhythms. And that's why we call it the pacemaker. Now, when you think about autorhythmic cells, autorhythmic cells rhythmically depolarize and repolarize, meaning that they're rhythmically firing action potentials. So when you see that spreading through the heart there, it's showing you, hey, this is a, 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 a bunch of action potentials being fired, right? So this is just action potentials being fired. And the reason that autorhythmic cells are capable of firing action potentials is they have a certain type of channel that's completely unique to the autorhythmic cells in the heart. Now, we're not going to talk about the pacemaker potential quite yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if you don't know the sodium potassium pump, you should, because I had the, the um, lecture over electrophysiology and the electrochemical gradient prior to this. So that doesn't mean electrocardiogram when I use ECG. I'll use EKG if we're talking about that, so there's no confusion. The ECG is the electrochemical gradient. You can't have the firing of an action potential without first generating the electrochemical gradient, so we talk about that extensively in the pre previous lecture. The only way that the cardiac action potential, EKG, cardiac medications, any of that stuff makes sense is if you understand the activity of the sodium pump and the electrochemical gradient. The sodium potassium pump moves sodium out of the cell, potassium into the cell. In doing so, all day, every day, it establishes this thing called the electrochemical gradient. We then use the electrochemical gradient to do work. So that's why you had the previous lecture first. If you email me saying, hey, I don't understand how sodium moves in or out, or I don't get terms like depolarization or hyperpolarization, go back and watch that video. Right, those should be kind of at the tip of your fingers, but they're going to be a major component on the exam, just those fundamental concepts, because outside of the scope of them, none of this makes any sense. So when you think about pacemaker cells, pacemaker cells have a special type of channel called a funny channel. Some textbooks refer to the funny channel as being a non-specific cation channel, but it's really called a funny channel. So when you see capital I subscript F, 
that means funny channel. When you see capital I subscript NA, that means sodium channel. Capital I subscript CA, that means calcium channel. The I is referring to the fact that they're conducting ions or they're moving ions around, and that's what conducts an electrical current, and the I stands is, is a, a convention for indicating electrical current. So autorhythmic cells, these cells right here, and we're going to focus on the cells of the sinoatrial node because they establish what's called the pacemaker potential. Embedded in their cell membranes, they have a special type of channel that's completely unique to autorhythmic cells called nonspecific cation channels, but I'm going to call them funny channels. They're called funny channels because they allow both sodium and potassium through. But because sodium has two forces promoting its movement in, they allow sodium in faster than they allow potassium out. So when you're thinking about how you can tell, you're looking at an action potential and I say, which of the following cells would the action potential above be occurring in? Well, look at the resting membrane potential here. The resting membrane potential here is around like negative 55. I mean, it's a real, you know, we'll call it negative 60, but it's a really, really high resting membrane potential, right? That's unique because neurons are at like negative 70 millivolts. Other cells can be at like negative 85. That's pretty high resting membrane potential. It's threshold, right? The point at which voltage gated channels activate is also much higher than like neurons, for example. So whereas neurons threshold is at negative 55 millivolts, threshold for autorhythmic um, cells in the heart, right, specifically cells in the SA node, because we're looking at what's called the pacemaker potential, is at like negative 40 millivolts. So what happens is you have these funny channels that are open, right? And while these funny channels are open, sodium's rushing in faster than potassium's rushing out. Because sodium's moving in faster than potassium's rushing out, you get a net accumulation of sodium in the cell, which is going to slowly depolarize the cell. The reason that it's happening so slowly is because there's ions moving in both directions. So the movement of potassium out offsets the movement of sodium in, but sodium moves in just a bit faster. So you're going to get net movement of sodium into the cell very slowly from an electrophysiology, uh, electrophysiology perspective, right? It's moving pretty darn slow. So what's going to happen is that sodium is going to cause the cell to depolarize very slowly. That cell is going to depolarize, 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 bam, you're going to get to threshold. Once threshold is reached, just like in neurons or in skeletal muscles, you get the activation of voltage-gated channels. But in this case, autorhythmic cells, what's going to activate are what are called voltage-gated calcium channels. So voltage-gated calcium channels are going to activate, and calcium is going to rush into the cell. Calcium is a big ion. Calcium physically is like 50 times bigger than sodium. So calcium moves slower than sodium right? So when that calcium is rushing in, you get this very gradual depolarizing phase in the action potential of an autorhythmic cell. It doesn't happen quite as quickly as like the depolarizing phase in a neuron. You'll see that that's like vertical, right? So you get this gradual depolarization. It's slowed down because calcium is so big. The only cell that depolarizes as a consequence of voltage-gated calcium channels opening and calcium rushing into the cell are autorhythmic cells. That's another unique aspect about them, right? Their action potential is totally different. It's triggered by something different. It takes place differently. It's not triggered by like events at a synapse. It's the reason that it's rhythmically happening is because of these funny channels. So calcium rushes in. Now, when the cell hits about positive 10, voltage-gated calcium channels will inactivate and voltage-gated potassium channels will activate. Potassium rushing out of the cell will ultimately be positive charge leaving the cell. And as positive charge leaves to the cell, the cell starts, retur starts to return toward its resting membrane potential. The return of that cell to resting membrane potential as a consequence of voltage-gated potassium channels is called repolarization, right? So 
you have the initial depolarizing phase, which is a consequence of funny channels, rapid depolarization, which is a consequence of voltage-gated calcium channels, and then repolar repolarization, which is a consequence of voltage-gated potassium channels. And those potassium channels will stay open just a little bit long. And once you get back to negative 60, which we'll consider to be our resting membrane potential, the funny channels or the nonspecific cation channels open again. And in that way, you get this rhythmic depolarization and repolarization that's completely unique to the autorhythmic cells of the heart. And remember, every one of these, every time this cell fires an action potential, because that's what you're looking at, is you're looking at an action potential in the cells that make up the sinoatrial node. Every time those cells fire an action potential, right, that action potential will spread through the atria, the atria will contract, it'll then spread through the ventricles, the ventricles will contract. So every time you see this, even though that event is taking place in the sinoatrial node, right, that's why we call it the pacemaker potential. That electrical activity will ultimately dictate the electrical rhythms of the heart, which will then determine the mechanical activity of the heart because excitation always comes before contraction. So be intimately familiar with that and think about slide seven, following along and answering those questions as we go through. Now, again, that's what we're looking at, right? We're looking at the action potentials fired by the cells that make up the sinoatrial node or the SA node, those autorhythmic cells. And that pacemaker potential will determine the electrical and mechanical activity of the rest of the heart. So sinoatrial node fires an action potential. Funny channels to voltage-gated calcium channels to voltage-gated potassium channels, each one of these is going to initiate a heartbeat, essentially. Depolarizing phase spreads through the atria, right? The atria depolarize, subsequently contract, right? AV node delays that electrical signal for just 0.1 seconds, gives the atria time to finish contracting. Atria don't fill up, but they top off the ventricles, right? Electrical signal allowed along the bundle of His to the right and left bundle branches, to the Purkinje fibers, which spread up the wall of the ventricles. As the depolarizing wave spreads through the ventricles, the ventricles will depolarize. Once they're done depolarizing, they will contract because the electrical event always precedes the mechanical event. So the atria depolarize and contract, the ventricles depolarize and contract. After the ventricles are done depolarizing and contracting, they will repolarize, as will the atria, right? Think about that, the difference between the electrical and the mechanical activity. The electrical activity always comes before the mechanical activity. So when you think about labeling something like this for an exam, be able to label it and also be able to predict what would happen to the length of this particular action potential and therefore heart rate if we were to change something. So I'll give you an example of that. So we have funny channels. Funny channels allow sodium in and potassium out, but much more sodium rushes in, so you get net depolarization. How do I know this is a cell in the sinoatrial node, an autorhythmic cell? Well, resting membrane potential is around negative 60, and the um, uh, threshold is around negative 40 millivolts. That tells you right there just the electrical potentials that you're looking at an autorhythmic cell. You also get this very gradual action potential. Like if you compare the amount of time it takes for a, a pacemaker potential to occur, which is just an action potential in the SA node, right, in the cells of the SA node, comparative to like an action potential in a neuron, neuron's action potential is like one-eighth the amount of time because the mechanism is a, a little bit different. So these funny channels are always open, right, That's or are open in the beginning once the cell returns back to resting membrane potential. That's what allows these cells to fire action potentials independently from input from the nervous system, right? So they're different than skeletal muscle cells in that respect. They can fire their own action potentials and therefore coordinate their own rhythms. That's why the heart continues to beat when you take it out of the body as long as it has energy to do so. So funny channels are open. You get that depolarization to threshold. That activates voltage-gated calcium channels. The only type of cell in which calcium rushing in causes the depolarizing cell of a phase of an action potential, the depolarizing phase of an action potential, is an autorhythmic cell, right? This pacemaker potential, these cells in the SA node. 
Voltage gated calcium channels close. Voltage gated potassium channels open. Potassium rushes out of the cell. The cell repolarizes, and then the funny channels open again, and the entire event begins again. Remember that every one of these pacemaker potentials, because that electrical activity will spread through the entirety of the heart, represents the initiation of a heartbeat. This is the beginning of what we think of as being a heartbeat or the beginning of the cardiac cycle. So just by looking at this, I can say, well, I can't see the heart actually beating, but because the cells in the SA node are working and we're assuming that we're working with a healthy heart unless otherwise told, right, this is going to initiate a heartbeat. It's going to initiate the electrical events and then the mechanical events of a heartbeat or a cardiac cycle, right? So... If I was to ask you what something would do to heart rate, would it have a positive or a negative chronotropic effect? Would it increase, decrease, or have no effect on chronotropic effect? Let's say you develop a medication that um, reduces or inhibits funny channels. So it doesn't stop them, right? There are still funny channels around, but it slows the activity. It binds to and it slows the activity of funny channels. So not, not as many are open at any given point in time. What do you think that would do? Would that have a negative chronotropic effect, a positive chronotropic effect, or would it uh, have no chronotropic effect? Would it not affect heart rate at all? Well, let's think about this. So we inhibit funny channels, right? That means there's fewer, fewer of them working. If there's fewer funny channels working, that means the gradual depolarizing phase is going to occur much more slowly before it gets the threshold, right? Then at threshold, the voltage-gated calcium channels will open and then the voltage-gated potassium for repolarization, but this is going to take much longer. If it takes longer for cells in the SA node to fire an action potential, that's ultimately going to slow write your heart rate down because it actually physically takes longer for these guys to work. And if your heart rate slowed down, that would be a negative chronotropic effect. So think about variations on this. And also think about what's going on with our sympathetic and parasympathetic control. So that was slide seven. We're on to slide eight now. If you are unfamiliar with the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, you can always go back in the chapter and read that chapter in the book, right? So you can go back in the book, read that chapter. That's very close to when we transition from AMP1 to AMP2. The two topics I tell my students in AMP1 that you're going to see again over and over again in AMP2 is the action potential, right? And the activity of the autonomic nervous system, the motor arm, <clears throat> meaning the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Now, if you remember, the sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight system, and the parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest system. They're antagonistic systems of control. Essentially, all your organs are innervated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic, with the exception of blood vessels and sweat glands. And whatever the sympathetic does, the parasympathetic does the opposite. So the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight system, increases heart rate or has a positive chronotropic effect on heart rate, while the parasympathetic nervous system decreases heart rate or will produce a negative chronotropic effect. <clears throat> parasympathetic nervous system, of course, is also called our rest and digest system. So because they're so important, we're going to do like an 8 to 10 minute review right now of the things that are going to be relevant on the exam with respect to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So when we're looking at the two arms of the autonomic nervous system, remember the autonomic nervous system controls things like your organs. We also call it the visceral arm of the nervous system. You have your somatic nervous system, right? So notice that this is different than the autonomic nervous system. Your somatic nervous system, the motor arm, controls things that are under conscious control. So higher order brain centers, specifically premotor cortex plans skeletal muscle contraction, primary motor cortex initiates it, upper motor neuron communicates with somatic motor neuron, somatic motor neuron communicates with muscle, you get a muscle contraction. And again, that's a review from AMP1. So these somatic motor neurons embedded within the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord Notice that going from your central nervous system from the spinal cord out to the skeletal muscle, there's just one neuron, one wire, 
And that one neuron, that one wire, right, is really heavily myelinated. So that electrical signal can travel really, really quickly along a somatic motor neuron. That's what allows you to contract your skeletal muscle, for example, when someone throws a ball at you so quickly. The turnaround time is less than a second. Now, when a somatic motor neuron communicates with skeletal muscle, it releases what's called acetylcholine. And that acetylcholine binds to what are called nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Nicotinic cholinergic receptors are really just ligand-gated sodium channels. So acetylcholine binds to the nicotinic cholinergic receptors in the skeletal muscle. The nicotinic cholinergic receptors, aka ligand-gated sodium channels, open. Sodium rushes in. The cell hits threshold. Action potential is fired. Action potential is followed by muscle contraction through the mechanisms that you discussed in AMP1. Excitation contraction coupling occurs. There you go. Consequently, acetylcholine will always have a stimulatory effect on skeletal muscles because the type of receptor in skeletal muscles is a <clears throat> nicotinic cholinergic receptor, which is really just a, a gated ion channel, a ligand-gated ion channel. Now, when you get down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system is your fight-or-flight system. Both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are regulated at the level of the brainstem, and then the hypothalamus regulates what's going on in the brainstem. So the hypothalamus is kind of the master controller of all this, but many of the nuclei that control the, para the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are in the brainstem. So the sympathetic nervous system... The preganglionic neurons all originate in the thoracic segments of the spinal cord. So when you look at the preganglionic neuron of a sympathetic motor neuron, right? So here's our preganglionic sympathetic motor neuron. If you're wondering where this is in the body, cell bodies and central nervous system, these cell bodies are in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord in the thoracic segment, meaning you find them in the spinal cord, in the thoracic segments of the spinal cord. That's where this is physically located. This isn't an abstraction, it's just a diagram to walk you through the anatomy. Preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system are really short and they communicate with postganglionic neurons in what's called the sympathetic chain ganglia, which is that structure that runs vertically along your vertebral column. The sympathetic chain ganglia, and if this is sounding like rubbish to you, that means you probably need to go back and look at it a little bit more carefully. This is an assumed piece of knowledge, but I'm not going to give you huge things. Of, well, I'm going to give you huge things over it, but I'm not going to not review it first. Short preganglionic neuron communicates with long postganglionic neuron in the sympathetic chain ganglia, the synapse here is a nicotinic cholinergic synapse. So the synapse used between the pre- and post-ganglionic neurons is always going to be nicotinic cholinergic, and the neurotransmitter is going to be acetylcholine. Nicotinic cholinergic receptors are always excitatory. So here you're always going to get excitation, meaning that this neuron communicating with this neuron will always trigger this neuron, this post-ganglionic neuron, to fire an action potential. Postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system are very long, they're unmyelinated, and they're highly branched. Why are the postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system highly branched? Well, they'd be found in nerves. So you're looking at your thoracic nerves, you're going to find postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system, and they're branched because when you activate your fight or flight system, you want everything activating simultaneously. You don't want to strategically just target one little chunk of the GI tract. If you're in a fight or flight situation, you want everything activating at once, and that's why those neurons have such extensive branching patterns because they activate multiple things at once. So these postganglionic neurons then innervate all of these organs and they communicate with them using the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is also called noradrenaline. Now remember the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. So when you're thinking about whether it's going to be stimulatory or inhibitory, in the organs that line the GI tract, why would you want to stimulate the GI tract in a fight or flight situation, right? Norepinephrine on the GI tract is going to be inhibitory as opposed to the heart where norepinephrine is going to be excitatory. The type of receptor for norepinephrine in the heart is called a beta-1 adrenergic receptor, 
Adrenergic receptors bind to epinephrine and norepinephrine, aka adrenaline, and that's why we call them adrenergic, activated or energized by adrenaline. So it's a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. The binding of norepinephrine to a beta-1 adrenergic receptor will increase heart rate. It will have a stimulatory effect. It will be a positive chronotropic effect. Heart rate will increase. Now, we also have the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood, which will have also both positive chronotropic and inotropic effects on the heart that we're going to discuss in the next section. Remember that the endocrine portion of the sympathetic response augments or reinforces the, the initial nervous system portion. So whereas all of the um, neurons or all of the innervation via the sympathetic nervous system is out of the spinal cord, meaning all of these neurons originate in the spinal cord and then they extend out of the spinal cord along spinal nerves. So the sympathetic nervous system, those sympathetic responses are mediated by spinal nerves. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is mediated by cranial nerves, craniosacral, but predominantly cranial, especially for this class, for the discussions we're going to have in this class. If you think about where the cell body for a preganglionic parasympathetic motor neuron is going to be, it's going to be in the brain stem, right? It's going to be associated with one of your cranial nerves. So whereas the sympathetic nervous system, these neurons are traveling along spinal nerves. The parasympathetic nervous system, these neurons are traveling along cranial nerves, right? Totally different. If you have a spinal cord injury, that totally interferes, you know, completely abolishes your ability to regulate your sympathetic nervous system, but not your parasympathetic nervous system. So this preganglionic neuron originates in the brainstem. It's really, really long, lightly myelinated, communicates with its postganglionic neuron, which is actually embedded in the target organ itself. So you have a really long preganglionic neuron and a really short postganglionic neuron. And the postganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest system, use acetylcholine. The acetylcholine receptor you find in the heart, specifically in the SA node of the heart, is a muscarinic cholinergic receptor. It's a G-protein coupled receptor. So whereas acetylcholine is stimulatory up here, when acetylcholine binds to the heart, remember parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest, actually has an inhibitory effect where it's going to slow the heart rate down. Now, I gave you a few mechanisms just to see whether you can tie the mechanism of action of epinephrine and norepinephrine comparative to acetylcholine at the heart. Can you look at the pacemaker potential and see how those different neurotransmitters change the pacemaker potential and how that would ultimately influence heart rate and either speed heart rate up or slow it down. Now when you think about the autonomic nervous system, so the A dot N dot S, the autonomic nervous system, this is when we're talking about the neural regulation of the heart. How does the nervous system regulate the activity of the heart? The heart can beat on its own, but the nervous system speeds it up and slows it down, right, in accordance with the needs of the body. So it can influence the chronotropic properties of the heart. In other words, it can influence how fast or how slow you want the heart beating, depending on your, your um, a number of different factors. So within your brain stem, here's your brain. This is your brain stem. There's a structure right after the spinal cord passes through the foramen magnum, that hole in your occipital bone, goes into your cranium. The spinal cord becomes the brainstem. The first segment of the brainstem is called the medulla oblongata. Where you find cardiac regulation centers or cardiac regulatory nuclei in the brainstem is within the medulla oblongata. You have two different centers in the medulla oblongata. You have the cardio inhibitory center and you have the cardio acceleratory center. The cardio inhibitory center is linked directly to the vagus nerve, which is your 10th cranial nerve that innervates pretty much every organ in your thoracic and abdominal cavity, whoppingly important nerve, right? In other ways, in other words, that the vagus nerve, portions of the vagus nerve actually originate in that center in the brainstem. They originate there and then they extend out. Now, when you think about the different types of stimuli that would activate the cardio inhibitory center, 
let's say your blood pressure spikes and it gets too high, right? When you look at this diagram here, this is looking at the neuroregulation of the heart. Now, in order to regulate any organ, you always have to have sensory information coming in. So let's say blood pressure spikes, blood vessels start stretching too much, that sensory information travels along nerves and ultimately makes its way to the brain, right? You have to have sensory information coming in in order to coordinate motor information going out. So that's where you see the afferent and efferent systems here. So let's say that blood pressure spikes and you go, ooh, we got to slow heart rate down to lower that blood pressure. So the information associated with blood pressure spiking comes in and that's ultimately going to activate your cardio inhibitory center. Now notice that here we have a really long preganglionic neuron and a really short postganglionic neuron feeding into the sinoatrial node. You know that this has to be the parasympathetic pathway. Also notice that it's stemming or originating in the brain stem. On the flip token, the brainstem communicates with the spinal cord. Notice here, when it says spinal cord, we have a really short preganglionic neuron and a really long postganglionic neuron feeding into the SA node. That has to be the sympathetic output. One, because it's originating in the spinal cord, and two, because of the relative lengths of the pre- and the postganglionic neurons. So we look at this and we go, high blood pressure, that information goes, processed in the brainstem, activates the cardio inhibitory center. Cardio inhibitory center in the brainstem activates the vagus nerve. Action potential travels along preganglionic neuron, really, really long to the postganglionic neuron, synapse with each other. Postganglionic neuron activates at the neuroaffector junction. It releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to muscarinic cholinergic receptors. And what that does, that G uh, uh, protein coupled receptor pathway, it ultimately inhibits the activity there via the mechanisms that are discussed on your handout that I want you to try and put together. And it will slow heart rate down or have a negative chronotropic effect. So when you think about drawing this, the vagus nerve comes right out of the brainstem, right? It, originates at the medulla oblongata, that preganglionic neuron is in, the cell body is in the cardio inhibitory center. You have some stimulus that says, hey, we need to slow heart rate down, like increase blood pressure. Cardio inhibitory center goes, ooh, wow, we got to, you know, that's not good. We got to lower blood pressure. Action potential travels along preganglionic neuron along the vagus nerve, right? So this would actually be the vagus nerve or making up part of the vagus nerve. Synapses with the postganglionic neuron embedded in the heart itself. Postganglionic neuron then releases acetylcholine onto the heart where it binds to muscarinic cholinergic receptors. The binding of acetylcholine to muscarinic cholinergic receptors in the SA node slows heart rate down. And see whether you can figure out, based on the mechanism of action, which one is norepinephrine and which one is acetylcholine. Right, It does that by influencing the way that those channels are working in the SA node. Now, other things that can activate the cardio inhibitory center, if you're just relaxing. So let's say that you're getting ready to fall asleep and you're reading a book and your brain goes, oh, we're relaxed. Limbic system, your emotional brain goes, oh, we're relaxed. That information is communicated to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus goes, ah, oh, we're pretty relaxed. It then communicates that information to the cardio inhibitory center. Cardio inhibitory center, then via the mechanism we just talked about, slows down heart rate. That's why we call it rest and digest. So there are higher order brain centers feeding into this all the time. Hypothalamus is important in so many of these things that you don't think about from day to day, it's ridiculous. The cardio acceleratory center is also in the brainstem. So let's say blood pressure gets too low, your blood pressure drops. Now you want to speed heart rate up. Your cardio acceleratory sensory information comes in, activates your cardio acceleratory center. Your cardio acceleratory center is then going to communicate, right? Neurons here are going to communicate with neurons in the spinal cord. So in order to regulate the sympathetic responses, neurons in the spinal cord have to be activated. They're controlled by neurons in the brainstem. So these neurons in the brainstem, right, are going to whoop, 
go down and control neurons in the spinal cord. That's what this little down arrow is. And that's going to influence the sympathetic nervous system because remember, the sympathetic nervous system stems from your thoracic nerves. And specifically, the ones that control the heart are T1 through T5. So the cardioaccelerator center is going to tell, right, the preganglionic neurons in your spinal cord, hey, activate preganglionic neuron to postganglionic neuron all the way out to the target organ. Norepinephrine is going to be released, bind to a beta adrenergic receptor, beta 1 adrenergic receptor, and that's going to have an excitatory effect. And I want to see whether you understand the inhibitory and the excitatory aspect based on the mechanism of action. So when you just look at this as an overview, the neuroregulation of the heart, what you're looking at here are the cardio-inhibitory and cardio-excitatory centers. So let's say you get really scared, right? You're, um, or you're exercising. But let's just say you get scared. You're walking through a dark alley and there's somebody following you, so your sympathetic nervous system or your fight-or-flight system activates. Higher-order brain centers activate the limbic system, which is a bunch of structures. Limbic system says, hey, hypothalamus, we're scared, right? We need to do something about that. Hypothalamus then activates the cardioacceleratory center. Cardioacceleratory center then tells the preganglionic neurons in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord, hey, we got to activate preganglionic to postganglionic, postganglionic, all the way out to the SA node of the heart. And where the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system influence the chronotropic effects of the heart, how fast the heart is actually going to be beating, are we going to speed it up or slow it down, is at the SA node. They do that by releasing either, if it's the parasympathetic nervous system, acetylcholine, if it's the sympathetic nervous system, norepinephrine, and those will bind to either beta-1 adrenergic receptors in those autorhythmic cells or into muscarinicholinergic receptors in those autorhythmic cells. And it will either speed up or slow down the pacemaker potential. So I've given you the mechanism of action, but I just want to see whether you can figure it out, the mechanism of action out, based on the description. Is that going to speed up the pacemaker potential or is it going to slow it down? If it slows down the pacemaker potential, we're probably talking about the... Uh, parasympathetic nervous system, and we're probably talking about the activation of a muscarinicholinergic receptor. If it speeds it up, we're probably talking about the sympathetic nervous system and the activation of a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. Now, if I give you one of these, first off, what are we looking at? Where would these events physically be taking place in the body? We're looking at this thing called the pacemaker potential, what you are looking at is the rhythmic firing of action potentials right here. How do you know? The resting membrane potential is negative 60 and it has a higher threshold, right? Also, the shape of the action potential, the actual shape that the action potential takes when you graph it out, it's totally unique to these cells, right? So you're talking about the firing of the action potential in these cells, which is ultimately going to initiate a heartbeat. So when you're looking at this, if I ask you a question like, where are we talking about? Physically, where in the body would this be taking place? You go, oh, in our autorhythmic cells, specifically in our SA node, and that's why this is called the pacemaker potential. Then I go, based on this graph, right, what would heart rate be? Well, this gets into dimensional analysis, and on the exam, you're definitely going to be allowed to use a calculator, and I'm going to enable the calculator option in Blackboard, um, the Respondus Lockdown Browser. So how would you do that? How would you determine heart rate based on this graph? Well, I know that every pacemaker potential in a healthy heart is ultimately going to initiate a massive cardiac impulse or an electrical signal that's going to spread throughout the entirety of the heart, right, producing a heartbeat, the rhythmic contraction of the atria and the ventricles. So I know that each one of these correlates with a heartbeat. So I go, okay, each one of those correlates with a heartbeat, and he wants me to measure heart rate in beats per minute, right? I'm calculating heart rate in beats per minute. So you go, okay, so this is the pacemaker potential. Here the funny channels are open. Voltage-gated calcium for the depolarization, voltage-gated potassium for the repolarization. The peak here reaches anywhere from positive 10 to positive 20. It's not important. It's going to vary by textbook. 
right? The the um, shape of the action potential is ultimately what's going to allow you to determine that, this very gradual initial depolarization, totally unique to the pacemaker cells. So each one of these, whenever you're looking at what's called a wave form, this is what's called a wave form, right? It has wave-like properties, and wave-like properties always have to do with what's called amplitude, the distance from the trough to the top of the wave, or from the peak to the trough. This is called the amplitude, and the distance from peak to peak is called the wavelength. Now, I could do this one of two ways. Both of the respective methods is going to give me the same answer. So I know that the time frame that we're talking about here is 2.4 seconds. So I go, okay, in 2.4 seconds, how many pacemaker potentials occurred? So I count the number of peaks within that 2.4 time frame, right? I go one, two, three. I know that each one of these peaks correlates with a beat. So I can say there's three heartbeats in 2.4 seconds, right? Now, if I'm calculating heart rate, rate in beats per minute, I need to do a little bit of dimensional analysis. So I want to get rid of seconds, and I want to go to minutes. How do we do that? By multiplying out fractions, which I'm sure you're already familiar with dimensional analysis, so I won't linger too much on it. So you go, well, any unit in the denominator will be canceled by a unit in the numerator, or vice versa. If I'm at 2.4 seconds, right, I know that there are 60 seconds in one minute. These two are going to cancel. And if I multiply 3 by 60 and divide it by 2.4, I get 75 beats per minute. Another way I could give this information to you is I could say the distance or the wavelength here, the amount of time between one wavelength and another is 0 0.8 seconds. So I know a wavelength is 0 0.8 seconds. A wavelength represents one event, one event, not two, one. Listen to me. Listen to me say this. A wavelength represents one event. So I could give you the wavelength, and you go, I know the wavelength represents one cardiac cycle, right? And if it's 0.8 seconds, I could say there's a heartbeat every 0 0.8 seconds. Well, getting rid of seconds to minutes you do that, you're going to get the same numerical value. In fact, 2.4 divided by 3 is 0 0.8. So I could give you the wavelength, or I could give you a graph like this in which you would have to count the number of peaks. The other thing that I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to say, if this happened, right, let's say we changed these things in the pacemaker cells. Let's say we inserted more, we activated voltage-gated calcium channels. We, we develop a medication that's going to activate more voltage-gated calcium channels. You go, well, how would that change this pacemaker potential? So this wouldn't change. But if more voltage-gated calcium channels were inserted, it means depolarization would happen faster. So this would go like this, and it would shorten the wavelength and therefore increase heart rate or have a positive chronotropic effect, right? It's just, can you conceptualize what's happening at the level of the pacemaker potential? Because that's how, and we're going to get into that in just a moment, how it works. So let's say that I had something that deactivated both funny channels and um, calcium channels. You're never going to shut them down, but let's say we have something, an inhibitor that just slows them down. Well, this is going to take longer, and this is going to take longer, which is going to have a negative chronotropic effect. So when I say draw the new pacemaker potential that you would expect to see from something like innervation of the parasympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, right? So cardio inhibitory center activates, uh, vagus nerve, action potential that travels along preganglionic neuron, and then pre and post synapse, postganglionic neuron, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to a muscarinic cholinergic receptor, and that's going to slow heart rate down. Right? So look at this new pacemaker potential. Look at what happens to the actual initial depolarization, to the actual, to the, um, the steepness of the slope. And I just drew that in, but here now we only have two per 2.4 seconds. So if you were to calculate heart rate after parasympathetic innervation, it would have a negative chronotropic effect and it would slow down.
you're going to have a lot of math problems in this class. Many of them are going to revolve around dimensional analysis, this exam being no exception. So on an exam, if it's a short answer question and I ask you to calculate heart rate for me, which you're going to have to do over and over again, especially when we get into the EKG, what I'm asking you to do is actually do the dimensional analysis. I want to see that those units cancel and you understand what's being told to you on a graph. So when you think about conventions for showing the work, here I have the equation written out where the numerator and the denominator are split by this horizontal line. You can also draw a dashed line. This is one beat for every 0.8 seconds multiplied by 60 seconds per minute. I know that this and this mean the same thing. If you feel uncomfortable with that, we can work through plenty of practice problems when we get into our study session and review of the heart for that week. So, autorhythmic cells coordinate the electrical activity of the heart, and then contractile cardiac muscle cells, right, ultimately physically produce the mechanical force of contraction. But before they can do that, they need to be told what to do by the autorhythmic cells. So you'll see here, right, that the autorhythmic cells activate before the contractile cardiac muscle cells. In other words, it's the autorhythmic cells that tell the contractile cardiac muscle cells to fire an action potential. And that's because they're linked to one another via these things called intercalated discs. Now, autorhythmic cells fire action potentials in the way that we just talked about, like cells of the SA node. So there's the pacemaker potential, but that pacemaker potential then spreads to the contractile cardiac muscle cells, and contractile cardiac muscle cells also have to fire an action potential. In fact, they cannot contract unless they fire an action potential. So when we're looking at these, we know this is cardiac muscle tissue. The plasma membrane, by the way, of any um, muscle cell is called the sarcolemma. S-A-R-C-O-L-E-M-M-A. -M -M Sarco means muscle, lima means sheet. So the sheet around muscles is the sarcolema. It's a fancy word for the plasma membrane of cardiac muscle cells. So when we're looking at this, here's the sarcolema. Where does the action potential take place in a cardiac muscle cell? It takes place along the sarcolema. Now remember that one cell can communicate with its neighbor via an intercalated disc, but what ultimately kicks off that cascade, if you remember, is the autorhythmic cells of the SA node activate, and they tell the contractile cardiac muscle cells what to do. The autorhythmic cells in the ventricles activate, like the AV node, and then the bundle of His, the left and right bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers. And these autorhythmic cells, this conductive tissue, then tells the contractile cardiac muscle cells what to do. And they can do that because all of this autorhythmic tissue is ultimately linked to contractile cardiac muscle, right, by intercalated discs. There's a direct mechanism of communication. So as those action potentials are traveling through here, know that they're also spreading along all of that contractile cardiac muscle tissue too. The autorhythmic cells tell the contractile cardiac muscle cells what to do. So in regulating the electrical rhythms of the heart, <coughs> you then establish the mechanical rhythms. When I say mechanical rhythms, I'm talking about the contraction and relaxation, not the action potential. A cardiac muscle cell needs to fire an action potential first, and after that it will contract. One is an electrical event, the other is a mechanical event, and we're going to beat that to death in the next lecture, which is over the EKG. So when you think about contractile cardiac muscle cells, they also have a unique mechanism of firing an action potential. So embedded within their sarcolemma, the stimulus for a contractile cardiac muscle cell to fire an action potential is its neighbor fires an action potential, right? That's different than skeletal muscle. The stimulus for a skeletal muscle fiber to fire an action potential is the nervous system, a somatic motor neuron, tells a skeletal muscle what to do. That's why when I say, can you contract your biceps? Activation in the brain, upper motor neuron to lower motor neuron, or somatic motor neuron, somatic motor neuron, out to the muscle, muscle contracts in response. 
Contractile cardiac muscle tissue, the stimulus for the action potential, is not a neuron from the brain. It's its neighbor firing an action potential. Now, the action potential that's fired by a contractile cardiac muscle cell is very different than that fired by autorhythmic cells or neurons or skeletal muscle cells. So if you look at a skeletal muscle fiber up here, resting membrane potential is around negative 85 millivolts, has a very, very short action potential. So skeletal muscle fiber fires an action potential, and then after it fires the action potential, after it excites, it subsequently contracts and it produces contractile force. Here we're measuring electrical activity. Here we're measuring tension or mechanical activity. Action potential, contraction. Excitation, contraction. The relative amount of time that a muscle fiber contracts is proportionate to how fast its action potential travels along the fiber. So a skeletal muscle fiber's action potential is a very short action potential, very similar to that of a neuron. As a consequence of that, if a single action potential travels along the skeletal muscle fiber, you get a twitch, right? Now, we won't get into summation and the things that we've discussed previously in a and 1. Notice the difference between the action potential in a contract cardiac muscle cell comparative to a skeletal muscle cell. Look at how long this action potential is takes place over the place of over the space of like 200 milliseconds. It's a ridiculously long action potential, right? It's like five times as long, the action potential. It's ridiculous how long it is. Notice that the action potential in the autorhythmic cells, the pacemaker cells in the SA node, look at the way that action potential presents on a graph. That's totally different than a contractile cardiac muscle cell because they're two different types of tissue. Contractile cardiac muscle cells, number one, have a really negative resting membrane potential. It's negative 85 to negative 90 millivolts. So you see negative 85 to negative 90 millivolts on this exam, you go, that's a contractile cardiac muscle cell. Now, what happens is, is the stimulus for a contractile cardiac muscle cell to fire an action potential. And remember, an action potential comes before contraction. So a cell has to fire an action potential, which is what we're talking about today. And then, not next lecture, but the lecture afterward, we're going to talk about contraction. And we're going to re really going to beat this idea of excitation contraction coupling into you. So when a contractile cardiac muscle cell fires an action potential, action potential is fired, broop, the depolarizing phase is the consequence of voltage-gated sodium channels, just like in a neuron or a skeletal muscle fiber. But then you get this really long what's called plateau. So rather than activating voltage-gated potassium channels directly, what ends up happening is voltage-gated calcium channels are open and calcium starts flowing into the cell. Because calcium is big and there's an offset of ions flowing in and out, that produces a prolonged what's called plateau to the action potential. Then voltage-gated calcium channels close and voltage-gated potassium channels open. Potassium rushes out of the cell, repolarizing the cell. So the action potential in a cardiac muscle cell is much longer, in a contractile cardiac muscle cell is much longer than in an autorhythmic cell or a skeletal muscle fiber or a neuron, the actual length of the action potential. And how does that influence the contraction? Where a skeletal muscle twitches because it fires these short little action potentials so it doesn't initiate the mechanisms of contraction for very long, Cardiac muscle cells, contractile cardiac muscle cells, because they have this really long action potential, they squeeze, right? So they contract for a long period of time, comparative. So when you think about this, this would be the sarcolemma. You get the activation of the voltage-gated sodium channels along the sarcolemma as a consequence of the neighboring cell firing action potential. Negative 85 to 90, you know you're talking about a contractile cardiac muscle cell. All of these cells, every single one of them, right? Um, 
Action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential. None of these cells can contract without an action potential firing. All of these voltage-gated channels that we're talking about are in the sarcolemma. They're actually physically embedded in the sarcolemma. So action potential in one, intercalated discs, one communicates with the other. Action potential. After the action potential, cells contract. After the action potential, cells contract. After the action potential, cells contract. <clears throat> so you get the voltage-gated sodium channels, rapid depolarization. Those inactivate. You get a little initial repolarization, but that's not as important to me that you, as, that, uh, you know that as it is that you know the plateau phase. So then you get the activation of voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium is rushing in, and potassium is also rushing out, right? So they're offsetting one another, and that's why it doesn't get even more positive. It plateaus out. So then you get this plateau phase, which is the consequence of voltage-gated calcium channels, and then those voltage-gated calcium channels inactivate along the sarcolemma, and you get the activation of even more voltage-gated potassium channels, which whoop, produce your rapid repolarization. But this action potential is long. And remember, the length of the action potential dictates how much time the cell is going to contract for. You always get excitation before you get contraction. So why is all this important? When, well, when you think about arrhythmias, an arrhythmia, so sinus rhythm means normal heart rhythm. The reason we call it sinus rhythm is because the actual heart rhythm is being established by the SA node or the sinoatrial node. When the sinoatrial node is establishing the heart rhythm, we call that a sinus rhythm. Arrhythmias are just irregular heart rates as a consequence of problems with the conduction pathways. So over here you see an individual in atrial fibrillation. Now atrial fibrillation is when the atria start contracting way too fast. And when they're contracting way too fast, that's very inefficient because they need time to fill and then empty, fill and then empty. So that's going to start putting stress on the ventricles. It's going to decrease the efficiency that the heart is pumping blood. And that's not good. Whenever you compromise the functional integrity of the heart, you need blood flowing all the time. This guy stops for four minutes, you're done, right? So we see there's an arrhythmia going on. These electrical signals are not being conducted like they need to be. Now, an ectopic pacemaker is just a heart rhythm that's being established anywhere other than the SA node. So sometimes you can get ectopic cells that develop in the ventricles and throw off the electrical rhythms by just activating the ventricles directly. There's all sorts of weird things. So arrhythmias are just abnormal heart rhythms. Now, when you think about all of the medications or nearly all of the medications that influence or are used to treat arrhythmias, which can be quite serious. Look at how they work. Let's review back on this lecture and then let's see how our different classes of antiarrhythmic medications work, which you're gonna to have to learn in your nursing program. So class one, voltage-gated sodium channel blocker, right? It's pointing to the segment of the contractile cardiac action potential that it inf influences. If you block voltage-gated sodium channels, it's going to cause the action potential, the depolarizing phase, to extend. And what's that going to do? It's going to slow heart rate down. If you slow heart rate down, you're going to lower blood pressure. You're going to do all sorts of things. And it's going to slow it down in a very specific way. Class 2, beta blockers, right? So that's what that B blocker is. So you got your beta blockers. Beta blockers are going to block the beta-1 adrenergic receptors if... Epinephrine or norepinephrine can't bind to a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. It's going to slow heart rate down. Class 3, potassium channel blockers. Amiodarone, which you use in like, um, uh, uh, you, you know, um, mega codes. When somebody is coding, you run amiodarone on them as part of the sequ sequence of what you're doing in your mega code. Well, that blocks voltage-gated potassium channels. If potassium channels are blocked, that's going to extend out the amount of time it takes for repolarization to happen. So not only is it going to slow heart rate down, but what it's also going to do is it's going to keep you in this plateau phase for longer, which can sometimes uptick the contractile force or the amount of time the heart's contracting. Verapamil, calcium channel blockers, they all work 
on a channel of some kind. So in order to understand that, you have to have a, a 